Well, we missed you all terribly over the last <laughs> month. I know you're glad to have us back. <clears throat> Obviously, the, uh, the issue before the Senate for the next week or so will be the President's deal with Iran, a very bad deal that has bipartisan opposition. Uh, as you know, I've asked uh, senators uh, during the day to be at their desk and to treat this uh, issue with the uh, seriousness it deserves. This is the foreign policy debate, at least of the last couple of decades, and um, the Senate Republican majority intends to treat it with the seriousness it deserves. The leader on this issue is all of you know, uh, who led us to to pass the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act in the first place was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, had he not stepped up and been able to get enough Democrats to support this, we would have had no voice in it at all. It remains, of course, an executive agreement, which means a year and a half from now, the next president will be able to re uh, start all over if uh, he or she chose to. Uh, so it is not a treaty and uh, will be looked at again, I assume, if there's a Republican president in the White House in January of 2017. With that, let me turn to Chairman Corker. Well, thank you, Leader, and thank all of you for being here. I uh, am looking forward to today. I know we're going to have a, uh, a very sober and serious debate about the actual policy that is before us. It's going to begin at uh, just a few minutes on the floor. I think most all senators will be there. And I want to thank him and others, uh, uh, people on both sides of the aisle, for the opportunity for us to, to weigh in on this. I think all of you know the President had planned to go directly to the UN Security Council through something called a non-binding political commitment and make sure that Congress had no role in this whatsoever. As a matter of fact, as we see the documents now, when they had planned for us to weigh into this, uh, it was going to be in eight and a half years. Uh, that's called the transition date. So at that point, they were going to get us to weigh in. Thankfully, we had a huge bipartisan majority. Ninety-eight people voted in support of us weighing in in this manner. We're going to have the opportunity uh, to do that very, very soon. And again, I, I could not be more disappointed in the outcome of this negotiation, which began as a dismantlement of Iran's nuclear program. And I think, by the way, had the president achieved what he began and stated on the front end, we would there'd be a hundred people in support of this. Uh, he also said he wanted to end Iran's nuclear program. All of us know they have no practical needs whatsoever for this program. They have no needs for 19,000 centrifuges. They have one nuclear reactor. They could buy enriched uranium far more cheaply from other people, and yet they've put their people through incredible economic distress over time for one reason, and that is they want the ability to have a nuclear weapon. I believe this agreement paves the way for them to be able to do that, and I look forward to discussing the policy around this on the floor very soon. I'm thankful, as Mitch mentioned, that the two leading Democrats on foreign policy issues in the United States Senate, the ranking member today and the former ranking member, both, they've spent more time on this agreement than any Democrat in the Senate, and they both oppose it on policy grounds. So we've got a, a bipartisan majority that opposes this here, a bipartisan majority that opposes it in the House, and hopefully we're going to be able to send to the President a resolution of disapproval which will be what the majority of people in the Senate and the House believe about this deal that should not be implemented. Yes. President Obama's deal with Iran trivializes the single most important and significant national security threat to the United States and its allies during our lifetime. And unfortunately, the trivialization does not stop there. Uh, with the announcement that more Democrats will vote to uphold the deal, now the White House and the minority leader are saying that they're going to stop the Senate from voting on the deal entirely. 
Senator Corker led the effort, as you heard, to get uh, 98 senators on a bipartisan basis to pass this process by which we will have an up or down vote and true accountability for each senator who votes on this deal. But apparently now the effort is to deny the United States Senate the same opportunity that the Ayatollah said the Iranian parliament will have, which is to vote up or down on this deal. That cannot stand. And I would hope that our Senate colleagues reconsider that ill-advised course of action. Not only does the Iranian parliament uh, get a chance to review this and be heard from, but uh, because the president took this to the United Nations, all these other countries around the world had a chance to vote on this. And yet the Democrats are talking about blocking the United States Senate from voting on it. The president's deal is a bad deal and the kind of deal that the president and Secretary Kerry said that they would reject when they said no deal is better than a bad deal. And yet if you look at the particulars of this, it doesn't prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. It gives them access to tens of billions of dollars to finance their terrorist activities. It gives them access to conventional weapons and ballistic missiles with which they can continue to conduct their terrorist activities. And it consists of side deals that none of us have seen. Uh, and uh, what we're told, of course, is it allows the Iranians to even do their own inspections, which uh, is, is pretty remarkable. You talk about the uh, fox guarding the hen house. So this is a bad deal. It's been rejected uh, by the American people by a two-to-one margin if you look at the polls. And in fact, since July, uh, that support for this thing has actually gone down 12 percent. And it's no wonder that the American people are, are turning against this deal. Uh, and there is, has already been noted, a bipartisan majority in the United States Senate and the United States House of Representatives that opposes this deal. Uh, and yet Democrats here in the United States Senate talk about blocking us even having a debate on it. That would be unfortunate. It would be a tragic outcome for something that is this important to the national security interests of the American people and the United States. <clears throat> And to know the intentions of uh, Iran and the supreme leader today said that 25 years from now Israel will no longer exist and continues to refer to the United States as the great Satan. So Iran with a nuclear weapon makes all of us less safe and less secure. We know their intentions and now this is what their capabilities will be in the future. Also today Hillary Clinton gave a speech uh, with a lot of tough talk about Iran but it's very hard to take it seriously because it was Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State who opened the door to Iran to continue to enrich uranium. That's the path to a bomb. She has now taken credit for being the one to open the door to what is a terrible deal for the people of the United States and the people of the world. So Hillary Clinton is going to be held responsible for the role she has played in this. But between Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State and President Obama, there is no red line. And we see this in their foreign policy around the world. We see it in Russia, Ukraine, North Korea, Syria, uh, Iran. Uh, this administration will be held accountable for making the world less safe, less secure, and less stable. Let me just add one thing before taking a couple of questions. Um, be prepared, if you haven't gotten them already, for a flood of uh, press releases coming out from every Democrat who supported the President's bad deal with the Iranians about how they're going to bash Iran in the future. Every single one of them is going to want to try to trivialize this vote and try to convince their constituents that they still are really tough on Iran. Uh, we'll be happy to take up any uh, bill that legitimately goes after the Iranian regime just as soon as it has enough co-sponsors to override a presidential veto. We'll not be turning the Senate floor into an opportunity for sort of therapeutic get well exercises on behalf of all the Democrats who ended up voting for this bill who are going to want to try to deceive their constituents into thinking that it really wasn't that important. I really am willing to stand up to Iran uh, we're interested in the United States Senate in making a law, and I think on this issue, the way you make a law, obviously, is to have enough co-sponsors to be able to override a presidential veto. Yeah. Uh, Matt, Matt, over, over in the House now, the moments before getting started on their own version of this debate, they now have a 
disagreement over whether the clock to September 17th had even started. Um, how much of a danger is there that this process gets backed up and then backed into the necessary debate on the CR and backed up until September 30th? Yeah, well, I'm going to ask Chairman Corker to <clears throat> comment on this as well, but as I understand the law, uh, Senator Corker, we have to act before September the 17th, which is next week, or the deal goes forward. Isn't that a, pretty much the way it works? Yeah, that's correct. I think the best way, as I said yesterday, to look there, let's face it, we, we don't have all the documents. Uh, we spent four days back and forth, uh, Ben Cardin and I, over a four-day period trying to work through these details of what documents would be supplied, what documents would not be supplied. And there's no question that uh, two of the documents are not here. And by the way, uh, I am sure that Ben was checking with Wendy Sherman and others. And I'm sure that they know what the protocol is at the IAEA. But I don't know where that takes us because as Mitch mentioned, as the leader mentioned, um, the clock ends on September the 17th. The president's going to go ahead and begin lifting sanctions. And I think most of us who know as much as we know about the deal, even if the two side agreements were available and pure as the driven snow, meaning they were outstanding documents, I don't think that would change our view of whether allowing Iran to industrialize our nuclear program uh, is a bad deal. So, so my point is, is that I think the best way to express concerns about the documents, but also concerns about the, the deal itself, is to vote to disapprove the deal and to go forward in that manner. That is the best way, I believe, at this moment for us to express our disapproval. It, that's not my message. No, I'm not saying that at all, and please don't misrepresent that. But I'm sure that the president is going to conclude that that is the case. I'm sure that the UN Security Council is going to conclude that that's the case. And I'm just not sure where you take that. Where do you take that? So, uh, and right now, we've got, again, strong bipartisan opposition to this deal. Um, it's my opinion that we're far better off focusing on the substance of this. And again, you can register your concern about the documents not being provided by voting to disapprove the deal. Senator, yep. uh, Senator Cruz at a rally today says that the vote on the disapproval resolution is a show vote that only you and Boehner can actually stop the man <clears throat> deal by not having a vote on it, uh, the resolution and thus arguing that the, the clock has not elapsed, that the clock hasn't started ticking, that those side agreements need to come to the Hill first before the new period ends. Yeah, well, <clears throat> maybe I'll call on Bob again, but as I understand the law, once September 17th passes, is it not the case that the president will take the view that he's free to go forward? Yeah, again, I, I, it, it's an interesting. I had, have had conversations with uh, uh, some of the House members that have put this forth, and uh, look, we, uh, as has been mentioned, we have not received all the documents. What is difficult to understand is what the next course of action is. If you take that position and you don't register bipartisan opposition today, which, by the way, as, me as the leader mentioned, that opens the door for the next president to look at this in a very different way. Um, bipartisan majorities in the House and Senate will have disapproved of what, of what was negotiated. Uh, over 80 percent of the American people believe that the president's agreement with Iran is something that Congress should approve. And so what in essence has happened is just the opposite, and we disapprove. Uh, we disapprove in a bipartisan way, and I think we're much better off at this juncture having the opportunity within the window, when there's no debate about whether the clock started or not, uh, expressing that disapproval. You know, foreign policy is a, is a, is a long-term, is long-term. And when you have the president with the powers that he has to go, go ahead with an executive agreement like this, I mean, we're fortunate. We were able to convince Democrats when they learned that really they planned on way down the road, us weighing in, now they learned it's eight and a half years we were fortunate to, to craft this opportunity for us to have 
an ability to express our disapproval. And I think, again, the best way for us to continue to be able to craft, after this president leaves, good foreign policy is for us to disapprove this uh, on the terms that we now have it. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody.